we have a wonderful guest on my show. His name is Harry, and he has this great theory called cognitive personality theory. And what I like about this theory is that it's really meaningful. It looks at a personality from a very dynamic point of view, right? Not a very fixed one. So I think it's very suitable for personal growth. So welcome to the channel, Harry. Hey, Leon. Thanks for having me on. It's been a while since we last talked, but it's good to be on here again. Harry, so can you tell us about cognitive personality theory? Yeah, absolutely. So cognitive personality theory is sort of what came out of me trying to like make sense of the cognitive functions. And I have this kind of this, I don't know, this need within me to kind of apply them on a fluid basis and kind of like, rather than just implying the fluidity and saying, well, everybody can use all the functions. I was very invested in kind of saying, well, how can everybody use all the functions and how does that differ? So essentially what came out is a system of cognitive functions based more upon kind of gateways and pathways than it is upon a cognitive stack per se. And generally it's a non-hierarchical model of personality because it's very much more based upon a cognitive map where the function is playing its own role, but every function is always fluctuating and moving at the same time too. So it's a much more dynamic approach to personality that I hope to serve as a nice complement to the existing array of uh, cognitive function approaches. Yeah, I can really appreciate an approach like that because what I see is that you can really see the, the possibilities within people to be able to oh, develop yeah. themselves in different kinds of ways. Exactly. I even kind of like deposited it as an individuation-based model when I was like hmm. researching into Carl Jung and stuff. Like, you know, I think it's right. the psychological types is fantastic, but ultimately what really gets me fired up is the concept of uh, individuation, you know, the right. kind of the reconciliation of opposites within our mind, the integration of the psyche. And so, you know, I'm very much growth-oriented as a person and I really wanted to kind of like imbue the system with that same hmm. kind of agenda. Yeah, and I think you are, are doing this in spirit of Carl Jung, because what Carl Jung is all about personal growth and individu individuation. And you yeah. talk about something that is really important, which is about transcendence, right? And this is uh, what's interesting about this is that he mentions this in regards to the personality types, but not a lot of people talk about it. Indeed. Yeah, it's very, it's fascinating to me, actually, how like, the words of Carl Jung about these psychological types that he was kind of like playing where I've kind of like got taken immediately into this typological framework, which at the end of the day, he really wasn't that interested in making. Right. He wasn't wanting to put people in the box as he was saying, okay, I've noticed these tendencies or these, these imbalances even, or like these various different ways people mm. can kind of be themselves. But his, his agenda was much more towards kind of the integration of opposites. It was much more towards self-growth and, right. you know, overcoming of neuroses within the psyche. And that was what his intentions were. And so I thought that was really beautiful. And I thought like, well, wouldn't it be nice to kind of take these psychological types, these kind of functions that he's correctly identified and kind of apply his own kind of spirit to them towards right. growth? You so know? I remember so, you yeah. saying uh, the best type is no type. The best function yeah. is none of the functions. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because that's the thing, like, you know, you get to infinity, you sort of get to zero. There's an entanglement of opposites there as well. So it's like, you know, if our type is infinity, sort of, it isn't a type, you know, it's beyond a category, it's above a category. And it's like applying it in every real world terms, I think it can be misconstrued as kind of like, well, you know, we should all be kind of called of function superhumans, kind of every I and a P should be a TE dominant at the same time and stuff like that. And, you know, I think there's still something very beautiful to us just being ourselves and to us being born with the genetics that we have or the kind of genetic memory that we have and the brain structured differently. Every person's brain's unique as well. So again, it's like, it's the entanglement of two opposites, the recognition of, you know, self-acceptance, but also self-growth at the same time. And then these two concepts are entangled with each other. And that's when, you know, individuation really occurs to accept oneself and to recognize one's opposite is also to go alongside it and work alongside it at the same right. time. Right. The key yeah. to change is acceptance of exactly. what it is. And I think like you're talking about here, a really good balance between nature and nurture and a really mm. genuine nurture is one that really embraces and, and treasures what our nature is. Absolutely, absolutely. And like I often say to my clients that I coach, for example, that when they're kind of working on growing themselves and whatnot, it's good to kind of like, yeah, picture the type, recognize this predisposition that you have, but also recognize the difference between an imbalanced version of that type 
where functions are working actually against each other, which is a kind of a scary concept. Right. Or, you know, and then contrast that with a balanced version of the type, an integrated version of the type, where functions are recognized and working alongside each other and complementing the type hmm. from that point forward. Yeah, can you tell us about that? Oh, what, what do you mean by cognitive functions working against each other as opposed Absolutely. to with each other? Yeah, so like, imagine, for example, like, maybe a TI dominant, who's, you know, like, you know, got this incredibly well-developed TI, they're really going into the criteria and they're really constructing these frameworks and they have these, you know, these kinds of beliefs and, you know, they're very invested in these kind of conclusions that they've come to. But when a developed feeling isn't integrated, this may have been the driving force all along. What they thought was their introverted thinking coming to objective conclusions is in fact cognitive bias underneath the surface stemming from their own personal beliefs. Right. So that's a good example of kind of like how two functions can work against each other. Hmm. Yeah, and can you give us like an explanation of integrating the functions in such a way they work, they're working together? Yeah, like working with the same analogy, were the TI dominant in this case to look at their introverted feeling and recognize it rather than suppress it? Suddenly they right. can see it and they're like, oh, this cognitive bias was there. Well, it doesn't need to be there. Huh. Does it? Well, like I can go into my introverted feeling and regulate that in the same way I can regulate my introverted thinking. That's when interesting. Both functions are regulated, yeah. then we get a level of transcendence within that continuum. Well, so what I felt like was really powerful there is that it's not really about compromising their cognitive functions. It's more like if you have the confidence and bravery to explore a different function, you actually further your primary function. That's it, exactly. And that's when we become a transcendent function. Essentially, oh. that's how the function is transcended, by becoming complete. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us more about your understanding of the transcendent function? Absolutely. Like, what's really interesting is kind of like, there are a few occasions, like when Carl Jung kind of like, really kind of integrates um, the transcendent function with the cognitive functions. But at the same, mm -hmm. so it, there's a lot implied by it. You know, there's kind of like, but if you apply what he talks about, the, the transcendent function, and I think he named it function for a reason as well. I think he has something very specific in mind by that. If you apply his work, the actual spirit of his work as well, the, the intentions he has to the cognitive functions, and then you read what he's talking about in the transcendent function, um, except for example, then suddenly you see, oh yeah, integration of opposites, cognitive functions. No, that's interesting. What you resist persists, cognitive functions, transcendent function, you know? Um, and that's like how we become transcendently functional. And that's what he, we, you know, was talking about with, yeah. you know, his writing on a transcendent function. Like yeah. the kind of the functions are just a way of categorizing the self at the end of the day. But, you know, it's kind of funny, like with the his words on the transcendent function, he transcended the cognitive functions and didn't need to talk about them because they were no longer useful. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Well, uh, and I think in, in, at least like in beginning with the type community and our information about typology, it's often very static kind of material. Like this is yeah. this is kind of like very much who you are and this is how you operate. Yeah. And, and these are how yeah. all your functions operate. And these are the functions you value. And these are the functions you don't value and perhaps like never value, yeah. right? It's, it's a, yeah. This is a very different yeah. approach. It's a totally different approach. It's an approach which really kind of like places the emphasis much more upon growth and using cognitive functions towards our own personal happiness and integration, much more than it's concerned with predicting the behavior of human beings across a population sample, for example. Like, um, you know, I think that there are other ways to apply cognitive functions. I think if you place an average of a thousand people on a certain spectrum, then certain people would behave in a certain predictable kind of fashion, but right. I'm much more interested in the individual at the end of the day. And like the individual, I feel that's where the music's occurring in many ways, you know, because that's when you zoom in and you get all of these beautiful fluctuations and dynamisms. And that's like, that's again why I use a type spectrum rather than, you know, a type grid or something, because everybody is in a different position on a type spectrum. That's know? true. Um, there aren't yeah. 16 types, like in my opinion, they are just 16 categories that we can use to neatly categorize what is in the reality, every brain being totally unique. Yeah, and by nature, human beings are dynamic creatures, and oh, we have like an instinct yeah. for uh, personal growth and 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 to transcend how we are. That's what Carl Jung means by individuation. I think so too. And um, there's also like you know you raise a point there as well. Like I think of um, context. Um, 
CPT mm -hmm. is a cross contextual model of type because it recognizes how when a source of so a stream of information is more pertinent to our brain, our brain will go into the function that's required for it. It's hard to yeah. FE your way out of putting together IKEA furniture, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Context is a very important part to consider. And that's why like a cognitive map and a system of gateways and pathways is quite useful when we're dealing with the individual, because that's when the context really becomes paramount. When you're talking about your stuff, especially like you mentioned about this idea of like, we kind of have a default state that we go to um, mm -hmm. because we, we are of like a certain types, but the, at, at the same time, the default is also dynamic too, because we're kind of like, yeah. the image I guess like a bit of a, rubber band that's kind of like stretching itself right and i agree exactly yes, and then um and yeah. then when it stretches and goes back it's it doesn't go back to the original positions more elastic i love that analogy and yeah i think a part of that kind of like that tendency for people other than simply moving around the type spectrum islam the way i had to kind of integrate subtypes into the system based upon kind of like the way our attitudes can shift attitudes within cpt about like let's just like say convergence and divergence. A convergent function sort of takes responsibility for an area and renders it malleable and changeable, but also kind of chaotic and creative. Whereas a divergent function is much more static and it's kind of aversive in some ways and scary and therefore it has to be observed and you have to kind of abide by it in that mm. way. Can, so like can you tell us more to, about the, the difference? Yeah. Absolutely. The so let's say like um, introverted thinking, for example, which is convergent, just like very highly theoretical. It also almost has an improvisational nature to it. It's constantly kind of tearing itself down and building itself back up mm -hmm. because it is by nature fluid. Whereas if introverted thinking is more divergent, it's about, you know, a theory which has been really thought through and it doesn't need to be touched anymore. You know, it's almost sacred in some ways right. at that point. The truth becomes much more sacred when it is more divergent because it's something which shouldn't be touched. It should be revered and rather abided by and used as a force for convergence within the more extroverted function, you know? So it's like, it's about using tooth that's been established in order to affect the world. The tooth becomes a bedrock when it's more divergent, essentially. Interesting. So like, can you tell us how it looks like to kind of bring the convergent and divergent into balance? Absolutely. So once like a convergent function has been integrated with its divergent function, it is effectively acting within itself and observing the divergent function at the same time. So let's talk about like an ENTJ, for example. An ENTJ is really integrated with introverted feeling, knows not only what they want, but also why they want it. And so that means they're not just kind of reacting to the world or sort of like engaging with TE for its own sake, they're actually doing so for their own personal happiness and fulfillment and for that of their loved ones and that which they hold meaningful. So that's an example of like an axis which has become integrated because I you have see. the interaction and observation occurring simultaneously with these two functions being entangled with each other. I see. So is it like what you mean by cognitive flow that we're able to use the cognitive functions with more purpose and more intention? Exactly, exactly. Once um, the two axes of our map have been kind of integrated with each other, there's a much greater kind of mindfulness, actually like an integrated kind of um, cognitive map, an individuated cognitive map is more naturally metacognitive because it's aware of all of its processes rather than just a select few and doesn't impose its own kind of narrative upon cognition either hmm. because everything is kind of working in a flow with everything else. Yeah. And imagine this is something that takes practice and experience over time. Like the more you do something, the more it's kind of automatic or more something that we sense of how we could be able to do it. Exactly. And I think a great way to train it is just to train ourselves to respond to situations proportionately, you know, not too much, not like a typical kind of axial rotation, which is really kind of, oh, now the world's falling apart after going to <laughs> TE, that kind of thing. It's just, you know, when there's a little bit of TE that's needed, you just do a little bit of TE. When there's a little bit of NE that's needed, you do a little bit of NE, for example. And like, yeah. life's quite beautiful in a way that it, unless you're really going through something hard, generally a lot of the things that life throws at us, throws at us aren't necessarily big apocalyptic scenarios. Usually they're just small little things. And it's just good to be mindful of the ways we're actually approaching all of these little things. And then say, well, what's the most proportional way I can approach this? And then mm. what's the other way I could approach it, which is essentially like tripping myself up and causing like five times more energy to actually devote it to doing the task. Ah, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So like in terms, you're really talking about 
how each personality type could go from a reactive state to one where they do things with mindful intention and not mindful not, intention. Yeah, and not in necessarily like a way that's it's not forced, like you're just forcing yourself to change. It's like it's just it's just yeah. something that's really natural. Exactly, exactly. And of course, like it, it takes time. I think individuation is a lifelong journey. I mean, I'm not even sure individuation is a final destination, but it is a direction. And I think it's that direction which is important because then we can continue to grow and become more within ourselves. Wonderful. So I, I know you mentioned in one of your videos, kind of like how you strengthen function. So you mentioned about strengthening um, expert thinking, expert sensing. So I was thinking yeah. like, What's a, what example like you have uh, personally applied this into oh, your life? That's a, that's a great example. Um, let's so, let's say instead from like a, an extroverted sensing perspective, because then it becomes kind of like more grounded in the experience rather than right. the, um, the objective quality. Um, an example of that would just be hitting the gym. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because you see, there's a way to do an exercise, for example, which is kind of productive. And maybe that would be kind of like trying to go through some intense theoretical formulation while under a very heavy barbell. Right, you know? yes. Um, whereas if I actually kind of take that away and say, you know, there's a time and place for you, it's not right now. And then instead you kind of, you ground yourself within the moment and you say, you know, you become aware of the tangible, but you also kind of shrink reality. Like I like to describe extroverted sensing as a lens. And as is extroverted intuition. But the difference is extroverted intuition is like that. It takes in everything. Extroverted sensing is selective, but it takes the same amount of mass and condenses it. So that means suddenly everything becomes very tangible and very high fidelity. So essentially, I've ended up barbell high fidelity, if that makes sense. <laughs> I've ended like my feet on the ground high fidelity. And that, and that is what enables me to kind of coordinate my body most effectively and ensure there's no injury, but also ensures that all the muscles are recruited as effectively as they can be as well. Interesting. Yeah, I could see that. So like in terms of like the times I felt like, for example, when I'm around expert sensors or I do activities related to expert sensing, like I feel like I, I am taking on more of that energy, right? I could experience yeah. it. I Then I can, I can easily flip back into my default state, but it's like yeah. I have like a taste mm -hmm. of it. And I think what you say is true because like, the one I have a taste of it, the next time I go around, it's it's easier in a way. Like it's because it's like yes. I, I've seen this before. So I yeah, know exactly. It's like, That's the thing. It's like mm -hmm. like we have for decades, I think, like underestimated the extent to which adults are capable of neuroplasticity, but there's lot, lots of emerging research which show, no, no, that's not the case at all. Right. Like if you keep learning new skills, new languages, if you keep trying things in a different way to last time, your brain is constantly generating new connections. That's new true. New synapses yeah. within the brain. And so that's, that's a newer scientific like way of kind of describing cognitive individuation in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, because that's on the biological side of things, that's what's going to be happening. Things keep integrating. The brain keeps integrating and expanding and becoming more comfortable with that which it originally had like a fear of, for example, was originally very uncertain of. You know, once we master a skill or, you know, become adept at a skill, let's say, we feel a lot more comfortable with it and it doesn't seem nearly as frightening as it did before. Actually, we can become so comfortable with it that we're able to perform it in front of a crowd of people without feeling stage fright. So yeah, Wonderful. there's a lot to say about yeah. comfort and integration too. Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I like how you always like bring this back to the, the facts too. So like, I know mm -hmm. like with uh, Dario Nardi's work, um, he shows, yes, like when the types are born, there's like a, like a stereotypical pattern, the brain kind of mm -hmm. lights up, but then, and there's mm -hmm. areas that are not as lit up, but then like, if you practice in the area, that's, that brain starts to light up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I just love how, like, how much like neuroscience is correlated with, you know, cognitive fluidity. And not only cognitive fluidity, but also a network-based model of cognition where all the functions are connected to each other and operating in a network, uh, in a map, you know, so to speak. And well, that's what like really excites me as I continue to like, you know, do more research on my end as well. So yeah, yeah it's all yeah. going in a really promising direction, I think. Can you tell us like, well, what are your next steps from here? Ooh. Well, the next steps um, for cognitive personality theory as a kind of like a public body is to place even more emphasis upon growth, place even more emphasis upon the fluid aspect, because I've promoted it so far, you know, in a very MBTI compatible way, which is great. And therefore kind of like, you know, type 
related. Very much kind of like, you know, this type of this, this type of this, this is how they're different, it's all fluid, but, you know, still quite categorical. I want to get much more to what I'm kind of calling applied CPT, which is much more like making it actionable, saying like, no matter what type you are, these are the different ways kind of functions can interact with each other. And I'm not saying you have to be able to use all of these perfectly, but there's a, a nice gamification kind of aspect that we can take to kind of the functions to say, again, like how proportionately am I reacting to my context? And that's what I kind of want to get more into. Can you, ta- uh, uh, can you tell me what, what you mean by that? Yeah. So like how much um, energy is being wasted, for example, mm. when I'm kind of given a new task to do? And what's the way of kind of responding to it better? There are definitely times when we have to focus and we have to become almost blind to everything else going on around us because that enables us to concentrate. But there are other times to take a step back and say, well, what's everything else? How does this relate to the broader context? Let's think before we speak, you know, all of these kinds of things. So there's a lot of kind of like common sense applications of kind of functions. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of um, how we think about expert thinking. And expert thinking is indeed, it is, efficient right well like mm-hmm. you can imagine mm-hmm. that actually like when expert thinking consults with the other functions is actually even more efficient rather than less and maybe okay. some of that is that stuff is less ex- expert thinking like like make me like taking a bit more of a pause like thinking in a creative kind of matter but in the long run more more efficient more efficient overall, which, as you say, is what extroverted thinking wants to do. So rather than right. the function kind of being inhibited by others, as you said before, it becomes complete with others. So again, it's like that integration kind of um, mindset with kind of the functions. So yeah, right. that's really cool. And yeah, and just like on another note, like um, the, the other step of CBT is like, while I'm working on this kind of this public sphere, I'm also starting a master's degree in individual differences. And I'm hoping to kind of like to begin a more academic journey, which is going to essentially allow CPT to, you know, get some actual research done on it mm. and then permeate down. So that means I can kind of take this pincer approach for promoting the model and, yeah. you know, create more of a bridge between the popular psychology and the academic psychology Excellent. as well, because oftentimes these two bodies don't really interact with each other. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's just like kind of the idea of balance in that broader sense, like outside of typology itself, you're bringing yeah. the academic together with the, the approach to what you've been doing through YouTube, right? And that's yeah. that's like really important because they're both very viable approaches. They all they both have their strengths mm-hmm. and it's not common people bring those two together, but you're you're choosing to because you see the value of it. Exactly. And it's like, you know, what's funny about CPT is kind of like it's much more of an extension of like my general philosophy to life um, anyway. Like that's kind of like, I think why I really resonated with Carl Jung too, because it's like, oh, this is really like speaking to kind of how I approach things in many ways, putting it a lot better than I had certainly at that time. But it's like, oh, this is kind of nice because this is like what I like to, you know, do in life. I do seek integration. I do seek kind of like trying to find two opposites and then like recognizing their entanglement and then, you know, fulfilling their integration. Excellent. And this is a really beautiful way to flow, I think. Excellent. So I'm going to be interviewing Harry on my other channel. We're going to be talking about just this, like what are ways that this theory could be applied outside of the typological sphere in, in, the, in the broader sense. So Harry, can you share us like what are ways that we could uh, look at your uh, content? Absolutely. So, um, you know, you can check out the channel itself, Cognitive Personality Theory on YouTube, you know, you'll see a lot of videos there, like some type comparisons, some kind of like deep dive into individual cognitive types, some kind of videos on like the CPT system itself. And on the channel, you also find kind of links to the website where you can find kind of my type services, coaching services, as well as like a little CPT blog that started up on the friend drop too. And, you know, I have a Patreon there as well. You can kind of see monthly live streams over there and join the kind of like this really cool little uh, cozy Discord community we've got going on at the moment, which is full of mm. CPT enthusiasts. And I'm really proud of it. Um, and then there's a CPT book too, which you can actually get a physical copy of now as of January, which explains a lot of what I've been talking about in more depth from a more fundamental perspective. Excellent. And I'm going to have some of those links down below in the description. And I'm going to have our interview as well in the description box too. So thank you for being on uh, my show, Harry. Thank you.